than an airline in a, in a week where the world aviation industry is in crisis. We have unbelievable impediments in front of us. Qantas issued a statement warning there were still a number of issues to be resolved. The administrator also announced that two regional airlines servicing Eastern Australia would restart tomorrow. Hazelton will operate flights to four New South Wales communities thanks to a $3 million loan from the New South Wales government. Aero Pelican will recommence flights to Newcastle and there's optimism Skywest in Western Australia could be airborne again soon. In Queensland, Virgin Blue is negotiating for Flight West planes to service regional routes. Unions welcome the news. The administrator is continuing negotiations with more than 200 parties over the sale of all or part of ANSET. Joe O'Brien, ABC News. The ANSET collapse and the government's promise to meet workers' entitlements has resulted in a new scheme to protect all Australian workers. Employment Minister Tony Abbott says the general scheme will protect all leave and pay entitlements up to an income cap of $75,000. The changes come as unions prepare to rally at airports tomorrow in support of sacked ANSET staff. Without jobs and missing their last pay packet, sacked catering staff vented their anger in Sydney. Tomorrow they'll be joined by thousands of union members staging rallies at airports around Australia. These are not stop work meetings, they are community rallies in support of the ANSET workers and their family. But with air services still chaotic, the Prime Minister's warned the ACTU not to make the situation any worse. The government's still smarting over Tuesday's clash in Canberra, and ministers were stopped from speaking at a union rally for ANSET workers. The last thing the Australian public wants at the moment is any kind of industrial activity that further inconveniences the Australian public. And I ask the Leader of the Opposition to unconditionally join me in issuing that request to the ACTU. But it's a request Kim Beasley won't be making. Confident flights won't be disrupted by tomorrow's actions. And he's accused the government of having a hide, lecturing workers when it's been complicit in ANSET's downfall. The Opposition's not letting up on Transport Minister John Anderson. Didn't you destroy the only hope ANSET had to keep flying and save 70,000 jobs? Yeah. But the government says says its payout to ANSET employees is generous and it's also revealed changes to its wider employee entitlement scheme. All employees will receive entitlements and protections at the same level of ANSET workers except, Mr Speaker, that payout levels will be capped at a salary rate of $75,000 a year. That's set to cost the government about $66 million a year. Lisa Miller, ABC News, Canberra. A meeting of hundreds of Islamic clerics has just broken up in the Afghan capital Kabul and after two days of talks they've decided not to give up Osama bin Laden. However, they want the alleged terrorist to leave the country of his own accord. In neighbouring Pakistan, the government is treading a dangerous path. President Musharraf has addressed his nation on television to confirm support for US retaliation and to explain why it's necessary. But as ABC correspondent Jonathan Harley reports, that's put him in conflict with thousands of Pakistanis. As radical Islamic activists intensified their protests against US attacks in Afghanistan, General Pervez Musharraf trying to soothe tempers. People of all ages, the elderly, women, children, all religions have lost their lives. Pakistanis have also lost their lives. Pakistan's self-appointed president acknowledges a significant minority strongly opposes his moves to assist the United States and says he's putting Pakistan's security first. And the generals confirmed America's asked for three things. The United States wants support of Pakistan, firstly intelligence, secondly information exchange and the use of airspace, and thirdly logistic support. The biggest test for General Musharraf may come tomorrow when religious leaders will hold a nationwide day of strikes and protests. Since he came to power two years ago, he's banned political rallies and it's feared that a showdown between protesters and authorities could be inevitable. Others warn of taking up arms. Ishaq Ghulani led a Mujahideen faction against Soviet forces throughout the 1980s. Then he was backed by the United States. Now in exile in Pakistan, he claims to have a million men ready to return to Afghanistan to fight his Cold War ally. Another jihad? Against yes. another superpower? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. 
And they, they're proud uh, on, on one jihad, they, they destroy one superpower. As people flee, religious leaders in the Afghan capital have been deciding what to do with Osama bin Laden. In so doing, they may be deciding the future of the Taliban regime itself. Jonathan Harley, ABC News, Peshawar. Well, our correspondent now joins us on the uh, line by phone. Jonathan, the clerics are playing this a little bit each way. That's right, Tony. They've said that Osama bin Laden should leave, but only if he does so by his own accord. And yet, at the same time, it's hardly giving a rock-solid endorsement of the Saudi dissident, who also happens to be a very close friend of Supreme Leader Osama bin Laden, an important financial backer of the Taliban over the years. So it will be compelling in the coming days to see which way it goes, whether Osama bin Laden takes up uh, the offer and, of course, where he could go. There are not many places in the world that would be happy to have him. Jonathan, on the subject of General uh, Pervez Musharraf, does he have general widespread public support? After all, he's self-appointed to the position. That will be the big test for him in the coming days, particularly tomorrow with this national day of protest and rallies organised by religious leaders. If indeed, as is feared, um, the scenes become uh, bloody and violent as tensions rise here, then it will become a, a very strong vote that General Musharraf may not have the full support of, of people and that this loud minority is growing in number and strength. It could be a real headache for him. Jonathan, just briefly, you were caught up in a rally there today. Uh, sentiment's running pretty high increasingly high. Just in the last couple of days, there's a real sense of uh, anti-Americanism, a real sense that General Musharraf is walking an increasingly delicate line, Tony. So tomorrow, again, will be the day when uh, most people will be keeping an eye on exactly how uh, violent and uh, tense the situation could be getting here in towns such as Peshawar. Jonathan Harley, our ABC correspondent. Well, the United States has called its campaign against terrorism Operation Infinite Justice. Already, combat planes are being sent to the Middle East and another aircraft carrier is on its way. And President Bush has made it clear that while international support is welcome, the United States will take action regardless. The US military machine is on the move. We're just ready to go over there and just kick butt. The USS Theodore Roosevelt, its 14-ship battle group and its 25,000 personnel shipped out heading for the Middle East. Once again we are reminded that liberty and justice and our way of life is not a birthright. The Pentagon issued orders redeploying dozens of combat aircraft to bases in the Persian Gulf. The United States is repositioning some of its forces to support uh, the president's goal. As the military readied itself, President Bush continued to exert diplomatic pressure, using a meeting with the Indonesian president to seek support from Muslim nations. I have made it clear, Madam President, that uh, the war against terrorism is not a war against Muslims. President Megawati condemned the atrocities. I would like to express on behalf of people and government of Indonesia uh, our deepest condolences to the American people. Russia's foreign minister supported the use of force. All means uh, shall be, m must be used in the fight against uh, terrorism and including when and if necessary uh, use of force. But in the end, the US is determined to strike back whatever comes of the diplomatic moves. We'll do what we need to do. Each day, President Bush fans the flames of patriotism. Tomorrow night, he addresses the Congress and it's already being compared to the address President Roosevelt delivered to the Congress after the attack on Pearl Harbor. John Shovlin, ABC News, Washington. As America still grieves for the human loss, the economy is also beginning to suffer. The threat of war and fear of flying has worsened the existing downturn, with tens of thousands of people losing their jobs. From New York, the ABC's Michael Brissenden reports. As America continues to build an international coalition against terrorism, Jacques Chirac, the French president, became the first foreign leader to tour the Ground Zero site. Like all the French people, which has been uh, terribly shocked and traumatized by uh, what happened here. Well over 5,000 people are still listed as missing, but the confirmed death toll is just 218. Many of them are firefighters. Engine 54 fire station was the worst hit. The station lost 15 of its firefighters. 
it's now become one of the many shrines of Lower Manhattan. So all you can do is tell them you're praying for them, give them a hug, and it helps out. Just show them love. The economy is also suffering. On Wall Street, the Dow fell more than 400 points before a late rally saw it down just 141 by the close of business. Boeing announced it was laying off 30,000 workers. Both United and American Airlines say they plan to lose 20,000 jobs and they've warned of a potential loss of as many as 100,000. The erratic behaviour of the markets is a good indicator of the nervousness and uncertainty that now grips this nation. And the government has now come to accept that last week's attacks have undermined the entire economy. In Washington, Alan Greenspan, the Federal Reserve Chairman, met for talks with Congress and the President left no one in any doubt about the seriousness of the situation. Not only have someone conducted an act of war on us, our economy has slowed way down and, and this is an emergency. The government has promised a big stimulus package and a bailout for the airline industry, but many wonder how far that can spread if the economy does sink into recession, as some analysts now predict. Michael Brissenden, ABC News, New York. As the global in economic environment deteriorates, the Treasurer, Peter Costello, has called on Australians to keep spending. However, investors are not in a spending mood. The share market has fallen again. And trading in the insurance giant QBE has been suspended, although the company says its US exposure is not crippling. The world's growth engine, the US, is stalling, an outcome made more likely by the recent attacks. You'd have to say that... Uh in the United States, uh, things are, are not looking good. Anxious to minimise the fallout, the Treasurer repeated claims the Australian economy remains strong, calling on consumers to keep the faith. I know the events have been uh, terrible. They've shocked the world. They've shocked us all. But uh, that's no reason to change your buying behaviour. Australia's prudential regulator, APRA, was also confidence-building as the growing list of high-profile corporate failures risked undermining confidence in the banks. No, the Australian banking system is, in, is very strong, uh, very profitable and, uh, and well capitalised. Market analysts the, say problem loans are not significant. Seen, they all sound incredibly dramatic and they're written up that way in the press, but at the end of the day, if you compare them to what we saw in 1992, this is nothing. But nervous investors bailed out of the banks in favour of companies like Telstra and Woolworths with strong domestic sales. Insurance giant QBE, already down 37% since the US attacks, plunged another 40% today. Today's sell-off was triggered by a downgrading from credit ratings agency Standard & Poor's, which described QBE's solvency and capital adequacy positions as weakened. A trading halt in QBE shares brought reassuring words from the regulator already dealing with one major collapse. We are confident in the strength of, uh, of, of, of all of the large uh, companies in the insurance sector. QBE says it estimates it will make a net loss of $250 million because of the terrorist attacks. It also claims to be well covered. Philip Lasker, ABC News. The Governor-General has urged Australians to stick together and not allow the terrorist attacks in America to cause division in our community. Dr Peter Hollingworth made the comments today after a ceremony at Government House in Perth. The Governor-General called for tolerance between all Australians, regardless of ethnic or religious backgrounds. We shouldn't have ill feeling towards anybody. Uh, and the important thing, really, is that... Uh, we understand each other as members of the human race. We value each other. Uh, we don't scapegoat. Dr Hollingworth also admitted the recent world events had put him on a steep learning curve in his role as Governor-General. Olympic gold medalist Cathy Freeman has echoed the Governor-General's plea for unity. Like many Australians, she's been shaken by the week's events. Counselling lines are receiving hundreds of calls as people find it hard to cope with both the tragedy and the uncertainty. More than a week after the attack in the United States and people are still finding it hard to come to terms with the magnitude of the disaster. Hello, this is the New South Wales Helpline. In Australia, helplines have been yes. flooded with callers. The normal sort of um, um, help that people are looking for, I think, is um, what we might consider a psychological first aid. I mean, um, things very simple like support, reassurance, comfort, and just the knowledge that there's someone there 
uh, for them to talk to. Emergency service workers feel particularly shattered, with impromptu memorials springing up across the country as a sign of respect. Firefighters generally are fairly stoic, but uh, I think everyone's been touched by the huge number of firemen that were uh, killed in that fire, 311 I believe at, last, at the last count. Dr Julian Parmigiani is convening a conference on coping with terrorism and mass disasters. The fact that the disaster was actually caused by another human being, I think people find it very difficult to come to grips with that kind of mass disaster. He says seeing the events unfold live on television gives the disaster a sense of immediacy. It was something that was uh, avoidable under someone else's control, so it immediately gives rise to a lot of anger within people. But amidst the grief come words of encouragement. Olympic runner Cathy Freeman today calling on Australia to believe in hope. It gives us all a great opportunity to unite and think more about a better future for our children. All agree, though, it will be a long time before the events of last week are forgotten. Sophie Scott, ABC News. Asylum seekers rescued by the Tampa have spoken for the first time of their ordeal at the hands of people smugglers. 219 men, women and children from Afghanistan, Iraq and Sri Lanka are now living in makeshift accommodation on the Pacific island of Nauru. They're in detention, awaiting processing, and as our correspondent Ben Wilson reports, most still want to come to Australia. From behind the wire, an Iraqi woman and her four children came forward to tell the stories of their long and difficult journey. She sold her jewellery to raise $15,000 for people smugglers to bring her and her four children from Iran to Australia. They ended up here. Her husband, she claims, lives in Shepparton, and they want him to know that they're still alive. We are here in Naro, and we in health, good health, and now. And we and go to, to him. Then she showed us a document alleging it was the death certificate of her friend's husband and that it proves he was executed. It will be the job of the United Nations to determine if that is true. This man paid $3,000 to people smugglers to fund his journey. Yes, I left Iraq to Jordan, you know Jordan, after Jordan, direct to Jakarta. After Jakarta to, to Ashmore Island. The authorities say the identities of the asylum seekers should not be revealed. Just by appearing in the media, they say could give rise to a legitimate claim for asylum. This man, rescued by the Tampa off Christmas Island, says he wants to thank the captain for saving his life. The captain who, was, uh, who rescued us, we are thankful from him that he rescued our life and uh, it was a kind, a good kindest of him on us. All conversations through the fence are closely watched by private security guards. But elsewhere, camp life routines are already being established, a game of soccer and seeking out shade. Another 119 people left the HMAS Manura today, this man bearing a message that the federal government will be eager to hear. Bad people smugglers are. They, are, they don't think about you, our lives, just they think about the money. And... Authorities in Nauru are now eager to complete the disembarkation of the Manura and bring the campsite up to a full operating capacity as quickly as possible. Formal applications for asylum are expected to be processed from Monday. Ben Wilson, ABC News, Nauru. Now, Phil Lasker with Finance News and Phil Mining Company. Pasmiko, the latest problem for our banks. Yes, Tony. Banks are counting their losses tonight after administrators moved in to try to salvage the company. It's got debts of nearly $3 billion. The administrators say Pasminko will continue all its operations for now, but are already planning to sell some of its mines. As Pasminko moved into voluntary administration, the banks were counting their costs. The company owes $2.9 billion to a banking syndicate, including Australia's top four. The Commonwealth Bank is hardest hit with a debt burden of $400 million. But mining and smelting operations will continue as administrators try to get cash back into the company. When you go into administration, what it means is that your creditors can't uh step in and start claiming their debts, you get a bit of a breather to continue. Pasminko is the world's largest producer of lead and zinc with mines and smelters in Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. 
workers at the Risdon smelter met the news with caution. Most of the workers be worried about would be entitlements, I think you'll find. The administrators say the majority of workers will stay with the company and entitlements will be met. The company has significant assets out of which the employees in fact have a first priority. $300 million has been secured to keep operations going until the end of next year. The administrators deny there will be a fire sale, but are committed to selling both the Century and Broken Hill mines. They concede other operations may also be offloaded. The collapse is being blamed on record low metal prices, a lack of confidence in financial markets and a poor Australian dollar affecting currency hedging contracts. But the federal opposition blames economic policy. All of this is a product of this government's economic management. This government halved the Australian growth rate with their obsession with their never ever GST. Shares dipped to five cents yesterday before trading was indefinitely suspended. Melissa Aston Welbury, ABC News, Melbourne. Now to details of another black day for share investors. The All Ordinaries Index dropped to a near 17 month low. Sellers hit the banks on fears of mounting bad debts and a slowing economy, but Telstra and leading retailers benefited. News Corporation lost ground as American television advertising reported its slowest growth in eight years, and other companies with US exposure also declined. Regional markets fell, exporters losing ground in Tokyo on fears the US slowdown will be worse than expected. Commodities are mixed, gold easing, but oil pushing back towards 27 US dollars a barrel. And the Aussie dollar remains under pressure at 49.1 US cents. And that's the latest from the markets, Tony. Thanks, Philip. One of Australia's last Anzacs, Charlie Mance, has been farewelled at a state funeral in Sydney. About 300 relatives and friends, along with politicians and RSL officials, attended the service at Sydney's St James Church. As a 16-year-old blacksmith, Charlie Mance lied about his age to enlist in the army. By 1917, he'd been gassed and wounded by shrapnel after fighting in a series of battles on the Western Front. Despite the psychological scars, Charlie Mance spent much of his life campaigning against war, telling children of its evils. Love one another. Pop tried to teach everyone about the futility of war. And he tried to reinforce the sayings, love one another and peace on earth. Charlie Mance had turned 100 last year, a relative youngster among Australia's remaining 18 veterans of the Great War. A gun carriage transported his body across the Anzac Bridge and onto Rookwood crem Crematorium. Sweden has produced a surprise on the eve of the Davis Cup semi-final against Australia in Sydney, preferring Jonas Bjorkman for the higher-ranked Thomas Enquist in the singles. In tomorrow's opening matches, Bjorkman will play Leighton Hewitt and Thomas Johansson meets Pat Rafter. Sweden has a proud Davis Cup record. It's the best-performed nation in the last two decades, making the final 11 times for six victories. Little wonder right. Australia is cautious leading into the semi-final. We're very wary of this opposition and uh, we know we have to produce the goods on the weekend. But While Australia predictably goes into the tie with Leighton Hewitt and Pat Rafter playing singles, the Swedes surprised, leaving out world top ten player Thomas Enquist, putting the onus on Jonas Bjorkman to use his more intimate knowledge of the Australians. Side, they know me pretty good as well, so yeah, I think that's going to be a 50-50. Enquist, an Australian Open finalist and Sweden's most consistent player this year, was stunned but also diplomatic about his omission. You have to respect your captain's decision and my job now is to uh, support my friends and my teammates. And Thomas Johansson believes he can upset Pat Rafter in tomorrow's opening rubber, while Bjorkman is playing mind games with Leighton Hewitt. You know, all, all the pressure is on him and uh, we're coming here as underdogs and I think that's the first time. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that confidence though and not really think about the pressures. I'm just going to take the confidence of, you know, the last couple of matches that I won. The team captains can change the doubles combinations up until an hour before Saturday's match. Australia has nominated Wayne Arthurs and Todd Woodbridge to take on Bjorkman and Magnus Larsen. John Bell, ABC News, Sydney. To the weather now and here's Mike Bailey. 
Thanks, Tony. Good evening. Well, thunderstorms have brought some light hail to some areas today, and the unsettled conditions are coming ahead of a cooler change. Sydney, of course, had another warm one despite increasing cloud. Temperatures 3 to 4 degrees above average for that range of 15 to 25 near the coast. They were a bit higher again inland, and in fact reached 29 degrees today at the Olympic site, Homebush kind of takes you back a year ago, doesn't it? Temperature now in Sydney is a couple of degrees above average again at 20.5. The relative humidity 56%. The wind is a light west-northwester and the pressure is rising. Well, temperatures were certainly rising through the state today. Very warm in all districts. Readings generally above average, including Canberra, where today's range went from 5 to 23 degrees, producing a top that was 8 above the average. Those high temperatures came despite increasing cloud across the inland, which did lead to some rain developing. The top for the 24 hours to 9 this morning was 5 millimetres at Yamba, and Armadale got down to 1 degree this morning. But today, with storms moving across the state, a fall of 17 millimetres at Bathurst was the top score, 9 to 3, and temperatures peaked at 35 degrees at Tibberborough. Around the capital cities, cloud was reasonably widespread about the southern half, but no significant rain to report, with temperatures mostly mild, tending warm, of course, about the eastern half. Now to the reasons for it, and there's a change moving across the continent, and it's cloud ahead of that which has thickened in New South Wales today. There's a trough and also a cooler change which will lead to lower temperatures for tomorrow. Ahead of that, a ridge of high pressure has been giving New South Wales above average temperatures, but that trough line through the central parts of the state is likely to be there again into tomorrow, producing more afternoon and evening showers and storms, especially about the eastern parts. Rainfall will be initially fairly widespread with showers and storms about tonight. It'll contract a little bit toward the east tomorrow and then tend to spread a little further about the ranges in the latter part of the day. Checking the capital cities, rather unsettled with some showers expected along the Queensland coast, including Brisbane, some late showers and possible storms for both Sydney and Canberra, and a little rain about Alice Springs and a late shower in Darwin. Now to New South Wales and another warm night ahead with uh, winds likely to be from the north ahead of a cooler change. That will trigger some thunderstorms as it moves through and the storms are likely again about the ranges later tomorrow. It'll continue to be fairly cloudy, certainly about the eastern parts of New South Wales and temperatures will still be mild enough even behind the cooler change. For the ACT, 8 to 20 degrees tomorrow, unsettled at first and again possibly late tomorrow. Over the weekend, though, it should be back to fine with temperatures mild to warm. In the Sydney area, north to northwesterly winds freshening ahead of that southerly change overnight. 16 to 21 near the coast, tops of 22 inland and some storms likely about the western suburbs tomorrow. Sunrise is at 5.47 in the morning, the first high tide 1.7 metres and the further outlook for Sydney back to fine for the weekend. Tony. Thanks, Mike. And that's the latest from ABC News. We'll leave you tonight with an Australian show of support and sympathy for the victims of last week's attacks. 15,000 people filling the tennis centre in Melbourne today for a multi-faith service. I'm Tony Eastley. Good night.